Hi, everyone. My name is Jay Miller. And my name is Hazel Miller. We're the co-publishers at Book Hug Press. And it is our great pleasure to welcome everyone to the virtual launch of Suture by Nick Brewer. Before we begin, we would like to acknowledge that the land we are joining you from this evening has for thousands of years been the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. And today is still home to many diverse indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island. And we are grateful to have the opportunity to live, gather, work, and learn on this land. We also acknowledge that many of you are joining us from different locations this evening. And if you wish, we encourage you to please um, share an acknowledgement of where you're joining from by using the chat function found at the bottom of your screen. Additionally, if you haven't already done so, please also feel free to post a greeting for Nick in the chat. We are delighted to be launching Nick Brewer's debut novel, Suture, with all of you tonight. Not only because Nick's novel is a stunning debut and we're so excited for the book to meet its readers, but because Nick is a very dear friend of ours. Did you know that Nick used to work with us as an intern? It's true. I met Nick years ago at a small press book fair that was held at the Fisher Library for U of T. And she came right up to me at my table and, and said, do you ever hire interns? <laughs> Which I found funny about hiring interns. But anyway, we called her in for an interview shortly after that and we hired her on the spot. We knew from the get-go that Nick is a force. We also learned early on that Nick was working on a novel and we secretly always hoped that she might one day submit a manuscript to us. And the great news is that she did. And we accepted that manuscript for publication. And here we are tonight celebrating its release into the world. Over the years, our friendship and admiration for Nick has continued to grow and grow. And we are truly honored to help shepherd her first novel into the world. And while we had, of course, hoped to be able to gather in person tonight for a uh, you know big book hug hug in person we're thankful that all of you have joined us here in this virtual space tonight and just before we get underway and bring our very special guest of honor out um i just wanted to go over a very quick bit of housekeeping for tonight um first live closed captions are available um, and to access them uh, please click on the cc function that you'll also find at the bottom of your screen and just follow the prompts secondly tonight's launch is being recorded and we will make the recording available for on-demand viewing um, on our youtube channel in the coming days and lastly just a very quick word about uh, the format for tonight so again very momentarily we will be inviting nick out uh, she will share a reading from suture with all of us and then, and then Nick will be joined by special guest Sienna Tristan, who um, is going to lead uh, an interview with Nick, which I'm really excited about. Um, and to all of you in the audience, we will allow some time or leave some time at the end to take your questions that you may have for Nick. So start thinking about what that question might be. And we just ask that, uh, that you submit your question using the Q&A button. Um, we may not have time to get to all your questions, but we will certainly try. <clears throat> if you haven't already purchased a copy suture, you may wish to order one or many directly from our website, bookhugpress.ca, or we would also encourage you to visit your local independent bookseller to get your copy. We'll drop a link to the book's product page into the chat function uh during the event and if you order a copy from us tonight we will make sure to include some suture themed goodies such as a very cool sticker and a temporary tattoo we actually have a limited number of signed copies on hand so if you order quick enough you can snag one of those too 
And now at last, it is my great pleasure to introduce Nick Brewer, who I'm sure needs little to no introduction to those of you in the audience, but please bear with me while I read her, her official author bio. Nick Brewer is an editor and writer from Toronto. She writes fiction, uh, which had mostly, which has appeared in Cantheus, uh, the Hard House Review, and Hypertrophic Literary, among others. She is the co-founder of Frond, an online literary journal for prose by LGBTQ plus writers, and formally co-managed the Microprose Words on Pages. She lives in Kitchener with her wonderful partner, Jess, and dog, Goomba, who I think might make an appearance tonight, maybe, if we're lucky. Uh, and Suture is, of course, her first book. Uh, welcome, Nick. Over to you, Nick. Thank you so much. Um, I was smiling so big during that introduction. Um, Hazel and Jay, y'all have been, from the moment that I started to get to know you, you have shown me exactly what kind of people and professional I want to be. And I have been so grateful for that. And did you know um, that it is almost exactly three years since you sent the email saying that you would like to publish Suture? It's in three years and uh, one week almost. Wait, yes, three years and one week, sorry. Um, I uh, will also, uh, since I'm in Kitchener, I am going to just provide a little land acknowledgement here. Um, and it's timely because um, I'm getting married next year, which is very exciting for me. And um, we're getting married on September 30th. And we decided this date before it was declared the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. So I've been um, preparing uh, ways that we can acknowledge um, that in our ceremony. And um, I found out that it wasn't until October 2020 that the government of Ontario amended the Marriage Act to enable Indigenous officials to perform marriage ceremonies according to their customs and traditions and to submit a marriage for registration. So that is, um, has not even a year. And um, I am grateful that um, settlers were not entirely successful in eradicating the culture and language and people of the people who uh, cared for and lived on this land before we got here. And I, in Kitchener, am situated on the Haldeman Tract, land that was granted to the Haudenosaunee of the Six Nations of the Grand River. And I'm celebrating Sutra today within the traditional territory of the Neutral, Anishinaabe, and Haudenosaunee peoples. I'm going to start with reading a little section of Suture, and uh, then I will introduce Sienna and we will chat a little bit more about um, the what and the why of Suture. Um, if anyone does not already know, um, Suture is gory, and the first excerpt that I'm going to read um, is gross, so um, mute me if you need to, um, and take care of yourself. I'm going to read you a little section of the beginnings of each character's story. There are three characters. Um, in this, we are at an art class in which artists need to um, cut themselves open in order to make their art, literally. The instructor turned on the speakers at the front of the room, a rough-edged instrumental album this week. The music was loud, always loud, as loud as she could reasonably make it, considering the neighbors. But the sound of the artists preparing themselves was always louder, lip-bitten gasps and the horrendous sound of students splitting open, cold metal nails on a bl brittle, fleshy chalkboard if you were attuned to it. Overall, the sound of the room was always wet, hands slipping on the edges of skin, trying to get a grip on the underside of a chest to heave it open, hearts beating sloppily out in the open, slowing in their suddenly cool surroundings comparatively, the slap of a lung hitting the workstation still slick with the insides of whoever it came out of, the erratic drip of the artists collecting blood in their sets of tiny stained jars, ready for mixing. This, little, this next little section is uh, the beginning of our filmmaker and a turning point in her early life before she 
has the chance to make it her own. Eva and her sister drove in silence along the lake, letting bluegrass fill the space between them. Eva held her camera loosely, capturing the jostling landscape and the blinding reflection from the water. She'd had her eyes out too long for most of the drive, but the ache was a relative comfort, a tangible pain amid the underskin crawl of dread, the tingling threat of panic. The final months of her marriage lay like sandpaper against her bones, rubbing her insides raw as they drove back towards him. In her purse, beside the divorce papers, was an envelope with the pieces of her PhD acceptance letter, a salve, a soothing reminder that she was not crazy. The trees flitted past her camera and she closed her eyes and remembered. Holy shit, I got in. With the opened letter in her hands, opened on the stairs on her way up from the mailroom, and almost no time at all to be proud because right away his, are you really thinking of going? Mm -hmm. As if the months of talk of her moving for her PhD had never even happened. I got in. And she shouldn't have flinched when he put down the book he'd been reading, but she did flinch at the sound of it, the slam of it, the rattle of the tabletop, she did flinch. And she shouldn't have taken a step back when he rose from the couch, but she did. I was gonna give you a fucking hug, congratulations. And, oh, sorry. And the ice of his arms around her almost made her shudder. It lasted hours, days. It lasted the rest of their marriage in slammed doors and hissed cruelties and damp apologies and ultimatums. She had gathered the rage-torn pieces of the letter in the early late hours of a Thursday morning of a Wednesday night, alone again with his exit ringing in her ears. She had gathered the pieces of the letter and begun to tidy, had begun again to inventory the his and hers of the apartment, each time relinquishing more and more to the his list until finally, that night, the only thing left on her list was her side of the closet and a small box of sentimental trinkets. It all fit easily into the trunk of the cab. And this last little section is from Grace, our writer. Um, and I'm just gonna dive right in so that we can then dive into conversation. When her family moved the following year and Grace had to change schools, she took what she'd learned from her books and used them to decide what kind of story she would tell her new grade seven classmates. Even this was easier than she'd imagined, keeping up home Gracie and new Grace without question. At home, she stayed quiet, studious, tidy, helpful. While at school, she tried on different selves, collecting friends and followers as she braided in fabricated pasts to build a jock, a prep, a theater kid. People usually just believe what you tell them, she decided, unhinging herself from the need to base her stories in any truth at all. At the library, she exhausted the YA shelves and moved to general literature. Early into the morning, in her new room, away from pying eyes, Grace devoured lives she had never even considered. She learned new ways of being human, but she was running out of places to try them. Even though they had hardly been in their new city for a year, she had already walked past the stationery store hundreds of times, often going out of her way to end up on the street, on the side street lined with beautiful, ivy-clad houses and the occasional home storefront. The shop window was set back from the street, difficult to linger at but she would do her best, straining to admire the colorful notebooks, the tastefully themed stationary sets, and of course, the word processors. Today, she walked slowly up the cobblestone path to the shop entrance, drinking in the details of the window display she could never normally make out. She had found a grade 12 writing textbook at her school library, and she had convinced the librarian to let her copy the pages of the book that showed the students how to use a fountain pen. She'd practiced drawing her blood for the reservoir with a syringe, and though the crooks of her arms were rough and bruised, she felt ready to use a real pen. She walked up to the glass cases and peered at the different pens, eyes bouncing over the signs warning against use for children under 15. She stopped at a tray of metal pens coated in soft pastel colors and a woman appeared to help her. Do you know what you're looking for today, sweetie? I'm looking for a gift for my mom, Grace said. She journals every weekend and her pen is a little old. She really likes pink, maybe that one there? Early into the morning, in her new room, away from prying eyes, Grace tried her hand at writing the stories down. Late into the night, alone, Grace learned that bleeding was a way of being human. And I am going to quickly read Sienna's bio so that you can uh, know all of their accolades, and then we'll get to chatting. Sienna Tristan is an author and poet who explores queer platonic partnership, radical compassion, and myth-making in their work. Her award-winning fantasy novel, The Heretic's Guide to Homecoming, 
came out from Indie Arts Collective, The Shale Project in 2018, and you can find her poetry in Augur Magazine. While the sun is up, Sienna works with the Word on the Street Toronto, one of the country's biggest book festivals, which is happening right now. And Sienna has very graciously squeezed us in between two events. So thank you so much again. And once the sun goes down, their time is spent finishing their second novel and playing with their baby bearded dragon, Jevik. Hello. Hi. It's so wonderful to be here. I'm so excited that we get to talk about this beautiful book, baby. It's hard to tell because it's uh, dark in here, but I am wearing my green dress in honor of uh, this beautiful cover. Nick, what a glory, gory ride you have given to us. I, I had a wild ride. I want to jump right in, but before I do, I want to remind everyone that uh, I'm not the only person who gets to ask questions here. If you have something on your mind, please type it into the Q&A function on Zoom, and uh, we will reserve about 10 minutes towards the end of this portion to ask as many of them as we can. Lightning round. We might not be able to get to all of them, but we are going to try our darndest. So... Nick, let's jump in with Suture. Got to tell you, when I was sending you questions for Suture, I uh, I called them Suture Qs, and then I couldn't stop saying Suture Qture in my head. Um, but there it is. So let's start with the structure of Suture. I'm very curious about the structure of the narrative. There's these subsections, um, as there are three main protagonists. We have the beginning is is the map. It just says a map the you know, the, the beginning is a map of your journey. And then we get to the beginning in which you meet a story, parenthetically, the middle in which a story takes place and the end in which a story begins. And then you get sort of a triple epilogue for all three of our protagonists. So I want to know what went into the composition, visually speaking, of, of this work of art. Like walk me into your considerations for giving narrative space to all of your main characters and for like the bones of this thing. Like how did you build its skeleton? So that more than anything, um, I've said a couple of times in a couple of places, Sutra took me 10 years to write. I just started writing it in a class in university. It was when I wrote the first story for it. And then a couple of years later, someone was like, this would make a cool like universe, a cool book. And I was like, oh my gosh, you're right. And so I started, um, I started thinking up more ways. It started with, um, with the visual artists who had to cut themselves open and use their organs. Mm -hmm. And then I started thinking of different ways that artists might do their art in this universe. And I came up with um, like six or seven different ideas. And um, I first had it so that the stories were very short, like most of them were probably under 800 words. Mm -hmm. And I had like four or five um, main narrating people and they were just interspersed um, with no particular structure. And um, Malcolm Sutton, actually the fiction editor or one of the fiction editors at Book Hug, so graciously, so patiently, so wonderfully guided me through so many stages of revising the structure of this book so that um, readers could follow it, but so that it also captured what I wanted. And what I wanted was readers to leave with the feeling that everybody has the same story, even though everybody also has the different story. Um, mm -hmm. I wanted that more than anything. I wanted it to feel like like, oh, I've had a beginning, and I've had a middle, and I have had what felt like the end of, you know, one of my story arcs, um, and then the addition of the epilogue was, okay, addition is not quite right, but um, the, those things all existed, but it was suggested that I put them kind of all at the end in the same place, mm. um, because it is the beginning of another story, um, and I just, Time is um, made up and <laughs> uh, I have had, I'm, I'm turning 30 in what, two months? I don't know, two months. Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and um, I, so I'm very young still, um, but I've, I've had some, some, you know, bullshit in my life and um, I wanted to leave readers with the knowledge that like we all get bullshit and there's more after. I 
find that really interesting, the idea of like everyone has the same story, even though the nuance is different and the the particular, I guess, like detours and side trips are different. It's kind of the same road. Um, because it's very much the sense that I got while reading the novel was that, uh, especially because the characters never actually meet up, like they never intersect, you know, um, it's just that their experiences intersect. And I felt very much that instead of trying to like hitch along for the ride with any one particular person, like in their mind or anything like that, it was very much getting a look at the world that they are all surviving together separately, but you know, again, together. Um, and, uh, and that really fascinated. Now I want to know what the other like six ways of uh, like maiming yourself for your art are. Like now I'm one curious. I don't know if anyone else, I think it's interesting. <laughs> one of them still made it in. Um, the drummer, Finn, yeah. Finn has a kid um, in her ending section and her kid is a drummer and you have to rip your forearm bones out to use those drumsticks. Um, my original drummer was one of my favorite characters and I had to cut her and I was like, no. I won't. So I, uh, so I fashioned all of the things that I liked from her character and put them into Finn's kid instead. Time um, is nonlinear, after all. <laughs> exactly. Um, and then I had the idea that um, people who played stringed instruments would have to use their own hair to string their bows. Oof. Oh yeah. And. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had more, but honestly, I've forgotten them. I'm sure I can, and maybe I'll go through my notes and I'll like share them on social media at some point. Do please, please do, because I think we could all use more weird artsy body horror um, yes. in our lives. Um, yeah, so I I want to jump into like, I have I have quotations. I'm going to be pulling out quotations um, from the book. I've tried for everyone at home who has not read the book to make sure that they're non-spoilery in the way that a book like this can be spoiled. Um, I'm trying to really go into uh, bits that are, again, kind of universal to the themes or to everybody's experience. So we're going to start right in the beginning on page 15 when we are with, uh, do we say Eva or Eva? Um, what I say Eva, but Eva, it great. Eva is our, our filmmaker. Um, and the book begins with this really interesting, like retrospective on her career and her life and the themes that have recurred in her life. And there's one little line, um, that says they couldn't decide how to arrest me. That's the trick. Be sure to rebel naked and they will be afraid to touch you. And that's like meant literally in the context of what's going on, but I also felt that it set up the rest of the book it, thematically speaking. So I, I, I want to know more about this concept of, of nakedness or vulnerability as its own type of armor, like especially within an artist's practice. Tell me what you, what you think about that. I love that you um, had this thought and you had this question because um, it, never occurred to me at all. And I love questions that make me think about things that never occur to me, uh, even in things that I've created. So, and I've been trying to, I've been trying to formulate an answer. Um, and so over the past year or so, um, I have begun to wonder if I may perhaps be, have autism spectrum disorder. Oh, I say. Uh, <laughs> hey. I, um, for a variety of reasons. Um, and something that like keeps coming back to me is I have never been able to be anyone other than who I am as much as I have tried. Um, I, I just, I just am how I am all the time. Uh, I made a joke in our little tech test before this. I was like, no professionalism needed here um, because Sienna's a professional. Hey, and Jayla are professionals. I am not, I don't, I, I, I am theoretically, but I, I don't have a professional demeanor. I don't really know how to have a professional demeanor. Um, I am always kind of just a little bit, maybe too inappropriately comfortable or casual or open. Um, I've always talked openly about vulnerable things. Um, and I have found that talking openly about vulnerable things and being open about vulnerable things um, can can be a type of armor. It can create a type of distance between you and um, other people, and as well as 
what am I trying to say here? There's a, a it's like armor because people don't always want vulnerability. Her vulnerability makes people nervous. Um, mm -hmm. But then also beyond that, um, talking openly about vulnerable things is not necessarily the same as vulnerability. As being vulnerable. Oh yeah, that's a distinction that deserves a little bit of a closer look. <laughs> yeah. And I kind of feel like in the quote that you brought up, like being naked, um, it's like, well, yeah, being naked is bound to make people feel uncomfortable, but like, it is not necessarily inherently in and of itself, um, vulnerable. It doesn't have to be, um, I don't know. There are like nudist beaches and like bathhouses in Europe, um, where like nudity is not in and of itself a vulnerable thing. Um, and there is, um, a distance, a loneliness, and a power that comes from people believing that you are being vulnerable when you're not. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that was kind of my, my musings on that. Sorry, I kind of went on there. No, please. That's the point of the event, Nick. It's your book. Um, <laughs> I think that's really interesting. Uh, the idea of the, the naked body, not necessarily universally, you know, uh, being a being a vulnerable thing to be observed and perceived, um, but that it might be in the context of this world because the body is seen as an instrument of artistic practice, perhaps more than anything else. At least in the in the in the social circle of the people that we're following, um, and so it's it's kind of like you know when you go into like a fellow reader or writer, it's like a general human being's house for the first time, and you like creep their bookshelf to be like, what's going on in your heart? What's what are you? It's kind of like that, but it's walking around and it's like warm. Um, <laughs> I feel like yeah. maybe that's how it would be for people uh, in, in this universe to see a well-known artist just sort of putting her, her palette on display, right? Yeah. Hmm. And in that scene as well, um, uh, I can't remember if I ended up writing it in, in a way that makes it clear, but in my head in that scene, Eva has actually left her eyes at home. So she's yes, never back on the bedside. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so she's, it's really just like a big old, um, stop making my body more than what it is. While, while also, um, if you are taking my body, acknowledge it. Yeah. Acknowledge what you are taking. Definitely. I want to flow this into like more, more cultural considerations, right? More universal considerations. Um, because this universe that you've built over 10 years is like so fat. It feels like it's been around for 10 years. And I mean, this is a compliment. I mean, this is a deepest, as someone who has also taken 10 years to write some things, um, it, it feels like it's had time to ferment and mature and really get into the woodwork of itself. So we got to talk about the body horror. It was what we're all here. It's not the only reason we're here, but we are very intrigued, Nick. We all want to know. Um, what is going on in this universe? So, I mean, for me, it was one of the aspects of the book I was most excited for because I really trusted the text to, to, to employ it judiciously. Like it, it wasn't for shock value, even though it is quite shocking at times. Um, so I want to know if you can cast your mind back a decade ago, like where did the seed of the idea for this world come from, this surreal world where the only materials that artists are able to use for like real art are their own bodies. And I want to mention like real art is being put in big scare quotes here because there are these little hints in the text that, that like you can make art not with your own blood and guts, like in one of the, in the intro that you read um, when we come into this sort of fine arts studio class, um, there was a child and the child is obviously not prepared to like do the real thing. And so she sits down at like this little kitty table and plays with these like plastic organs and makes a, what is ostensibly a piece of art. You know, the adults in the room uh, observe it as a piece of art and they're like, oh, I really like what you made here. So like, it's clearly not impossible in the laws of the universe. Um, and also with, um, with a young Grace, you know, she mentions feeling ready to use a real pen, which like denotes that there are like fake pens or lesser pens that, that like do the job, but just aren't considered, I don't know, like proper or, or appropriate for art making. So I'm really curious about how you arrived at this idea of a society that like can, doesn't have to, but like, but does do this with, with the human body and, and art making. 
Yeah. Um, so the story that started it all, I was in a satire class and for a final assignment, we could either write a satire or write an essay. And I was like, well, I'm going to write a satire, obviously. <laughs> um, and so uh, it was called On Judging Art. And it's, um, you can spot it in the book. It's when a college aged Finn, who's our visual artist, she's kind of, um, she's going over all the art that she's made over the past four years, I think, of her um, college degree. And she's looking at all the feedback and it's very pointedly um, pointing at how cruel it is to suggest that there is any kind of objectivity um, in reviewing art or evaluating art. Um, and that was what I wanted to get at there was like the cruelty mm -hmm. of evaluating art. Um, because I was 19 years old and that's what was important to me. <laughs> and then as I got older and I continued to develop this book and I experienced things that were um, actually unpleasant, um, I, I started thinking about the kind of like tortured artist kind of mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm that we've got, um, that, we, mm -hmm. that we idolize, like, we really put that up on a pedestal, oh yeah. Yeah, and, um, it's not a sat, like, like, Suture's not a satire anymore, it's really, it was just, I don't know, it's my heart in a book, mm -hmm. um, but I did want to use that body horror to examine the, um, the pain and vulnerability that goes into making art. Um, but then I also like, all of the artists achieve some kind of success in their fields um, at a great cost to themselves. And by the end of their stories or in their epilogues, each of them is also kind of over it. <laughs> um, and it's kind of like, oh, this wasn't, this wasn't really what I thought it was. Um, mm -hmm. And it makes me think of um, writers who, I mean, even myself, but I'm still early career, but writers who like in their early career are really like, like rah, rah. And like, I don't sleep. Mm -hmm. And like, I, um, I sleep two hours a night so that I can work six jobs and like really glamorizing burnout and the hustle and um, substance abuse and a lot of cases um mm -hmm. and um which is not to say that like these things are bad like if you're not a bad person if you do these things there are a variety of things that lead people to, to act this way but I feel like we have had a history of uh or a habit of glamorizing really unhealthy behavior in artists um, mm -hmm. yeah kind of, that that kind of went into um almost like softening suture a little bit mm -hmm. even though still very gory um did I answer the question I feel like I kind of walked around it we meander but that's the point again I feel that the this the fact that you considered a softening is really interesting because like it is it is a truly visceral but it actually in my opinion it still hues really close to the point of itself like it's never like oh and this is just meant to squick you out it's like no all of this is being told in the context of as you say, like either art making or like the scrutiny of art as, as a product, right? As a commodity or as like a statement on culture and, uh, and what gets to qualify as art. And like, I have had, I, I, when I was reading the, the comments from the, um, from all of the, uh, the profs, um, over that, yes, like, Ooh, this, this hurts. Like, this is, you know, I'm sure so many people are like, I've had at least one experience like this, even if it's just like, Oh, marks on an essay or something like that. But especially if you've had a portfolio of any kind, um, the pain is real, everybody. <laughs> and like, you're putting stuff out on your, you know, from your soul. And I guess like, this is very much an externalization of that, of like, li quite literally, here's my blood and guts on a page. We, we use that metaphor, right? In our, in earth society all the time. Like, oh, like I put my heart and soul on into this. And, and now it's like, actually, and like, I've had to like modify it in order to meet 
weird, like these are almost body image standards, but they're not, they're like art image standards. Like some people are like, oh, like your lungs are like a little bumpy. Um, you should fix that. Cause it's my aesthetic taste. And like, she does that. And like, there's health repercussions. Yeah. Um, and I just find it, I find it such a fascinating and like really, uh, really incisive be like this is what happens like if you listen to all of those voices um or try to listen to all of them equally then it's 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 gonna be a shit show <laughs> like yes it's gonna be a horror show um yeah definitely I to speak of successful artistic careers and to speak of the the suffering artists this super annoying archetype that we all have hanging like a scimitar over our heads, whether we like it or not, whether we subscribe to it or not. I want to bring up um, Eva's voiceover script. This is something that comes in around the first third of the book. I'm going to read just a little bit of it. It's from pages 91 to 92. If you have copies at home, you can follow along. Do you think people realize it hurts? Hurts everyone. Hurts us, hurts the people who love us, hurts the people we love. Would you still go to galleries if you had to listen to every chest being sliced open? Would you still want it if you knew how much it hurts? If you had to clean up the blood to the soundtrack of every held breath, of every groan, <laughs> but you don't even want to see the scars. Like I, when I, when I read this and, and the whole thing in its entirety, because it's a truncated version, but like the whole thing in its entirety, like I teared up. I was like, ooh, <laughs> like they don't, do they? <laughs> um, and I... I, I just, one of the biggest reasons I think is because of the fact that, as you said, like our society seems to have this incredible judgmental, like, uh, entitlement, like to take an artist's art and be like, here's my opinion on this. I know nothing about you. I know nothing about what it took for you to make this and then share it publicly, but, uh, I'm gonna have an opinion and like in a way that is their right. But I feel that our society seems to love art and revere art and have absolutely no care or respect or regard for the artists, like for the human people that make the things. Um, and I just, I wanna know a little bit about this voiceover monologue and, and, and how that came out of you. Um, especially being that you are like in your early career and, and you began writing this quite young, like I, I wanna know perhaps how, the, how your observations of that part of our culture have evolved over time. Um, and also maybe what you're hoping to see us shift towards. That voiceover, that sentiment in particular, well, it started as um, someone's mom, I think Finn's mom. Mm -hmm. um, it started as her having um, thoughts, those thoughts. Um, she, in an early version, she's got like a series of monologues um, throughout the book. And uh, she's in like a support group for parents whose children are artists. Um, because it must be horrible, you know? Like, it must be absolutely horrible if the thing that your kid wants to do is literally cut themselves open to make again art. Again and again, yeah. Again and again, over and over. And um, so that's where that came from. And um, I was in... It, it evolved because I was in a relationship with somebody who... Um, uh, did not care about their own well-being at all mm. and it was really really difficult um to be in that because also I am somebody um I have a difficult time caring for my own well-being um but I understand that I have to and so I try um and this person that I was in a relationship with they just never tried and um mm. so that sentiment actually has less to do with art and more to do with the agony of caring about people who um, are not cared for. That's where it came from. Mm -hmm. um, and then I expanded it. I just expanded it so that everyone would be able to feel it. Um, this is like, this feels so arrogant of me to say, but while you were reading it, like I got goosebumps. Am I allowed to say that? that you are, you are allowed to say that. Yes, please <laughs> enjoy your own work. That's the point of the book. Please enjoy your own work. <laughs> so um, yeah, I wanted everyone to be able to feel it. I wanted people who love people who have a difficult time caring about their own well-being to feel it. 
Um, I wanted people who are in pain and who feel overlooked to feel it. Um, I just, I wanted people to feel that whether they were an artist or not, there are so many people who are in pain and who are overlooked, you know? And like, that's, that's what I wanted for that. At some point in the past 10 years, it stopped being a book about art and it started being a book about being human. Mm. If that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And empathy and like the point where empathy becomes compassion. Um, I love it. I have just got one eye on the time and I realized we're coming up real close to uh, me having to hand the mic over metaphorically to everybody who is screaming along in the chat, by the way, you have lots of lovely people here. So I'm going to squeak this one last question in, which is around halfway through the novel, there was a moment that I had to just like pause and like put the book down and just like close my eyes and savor it. Uh, and this is a moment where Eva and her wife have to go pick up a cake. And Eva has, is going blind at this point. She can only see in black and white. Um, and Dev describes the colors of the cake to her. Uh, she says, the background is mostly this unbelievable plum color. It's so dark and rich and those highlights are maroon and burgundy. And then the flowers are all cream colored and amethyst. Um, and then when they go to pay for the cake, the baker has watched this and the baker just like flat out refuses to take their money. And he says, not today, amore mio. That was too beautiful. Today it is yours, a gift as that was to me. And I like loved it to pieces because I have had moments like that with these, like there's this artistic exchange between two artists, possibly often of different mediums and like the only transaction like transaction doesn't even come into it. It's just like, I have given you something beautiful. You have given me something beautiful. This is enough. Like this is nourishing. And I, beyond asking like about this in the book, I want to ask about this in your life. Um, personally, I want to know if you've had any moments like this and, and what they mean to you, if you can express that. I, I haven't had very many moments like this in um, the art world, um, but that that moment and um, Eva's relationship with her wife is completely 100% draws on all of the love and safety and support that I have found in my relationship with my fiance. Um, and I, um, I, I didn't, um, so it's not that I didn't want to be alive um, before this, but it's that it was um, like, I didn't get much joy out of it, out of like living. Um, and then I met her and I fell in love with her and um, I met her family and I fell in love with her family and uh, I met her friends and I fell in love with her friends. <laughs> and not so many of them are here tonight. This is a little embarrassing, but um, at some point during all that, uh, something in me switched and I was like oh this is what it is mm -hmm. this is what it is that people love about life mm -hmm. um, it is the kindness of someone baking you a birthday cake or it is the kindness of someone staying with you on your annual worst day um mm -hmm. I had something that I wanted to, <laughs> my best friend in the chat just said she's crying because we've been to hell and back together. Cry and more. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, and um, it's, it's this partnership and we are not, um, like my, my girlfriend and I, we're not like the same type of person. I'm this like weird, awkward, anxious writer, right? Um, and she's this like chill, cool as a cucumber, little nerd that plays soccer. And um, we're totally different people. But the, um, just the genuine support that I get from her and then I get from all of the people in her life made me, um, made me realize that, that transactions don't have to be transactions, like you said. It is just an exchange of something beautiful. Um, and in my case, it has been an exchange of just living life, kindness, food, company. Um, but I wanted to put that into the book and that seemed like the best way to 
put it in there that that beautiful kindness that her wife can do her when she's losing her color. Thank you for giving us a sliver of your own heart just there. Love to get some of that. Um, like we said, talking about being vulnerable is different from being vulnerable. How's it feel? <laughs> scary <laughs> scary I bet we're gonna jump into <laughs> we're gonna jump into audience questions now we're gonna start with um, a question from Lindsay Zervogel who asks can you tell us about the cover and the process of choosing the cover the cover art it is it is just so perfect so tell us about the cover it literally is perfect Lindsay like and that's it and um so there was no there was no choosing um uh Ingrid just she sent a, a mock-up and she was like, how about something like this? And I was like, yep. And then she sent the final cover and she was like, so this? And I was like, yep. <laughs> I, um, my only request um, in my, my little notes that I could make in requesting the cover was I didn't want any kind of red at all. Mm -hmm. um, and then I was like, for some reason, this book speaks to me in like a coral and like kind of navy blue or tealish color. And so we've got like a coral on the side of orange and teal and it split and it, I, it was just perfect. It was literally just perfect. I didn't have to do anything. She just was magic. Everybody who's got a copy of Suture at Home, you should also know that uh, as far as I'm concerned, Ingrid has also done an incredible job of typesetting the book. Um, your eyes will be able to just relax reading it. So please enjoy that physical experience. Next question. Um, to speak of personal questions and also metaphorical questions, Vanessa Shields asks, Nick, what organs do you use when creating your art? Um, I use, okay, I'm going to say my brain and that sounds, that sounds like cheating, but I don't mean that I use like my brain. Sometimes it literally feels like I'm like walking around inside my brain and and like squeezing it. Um, so yeah, it's massaging like massaging ideas out of it. Yeah, it's like I have to like go for a walk mm -hmm. through my brain, and sometimes I'll like sit in a clearing um, in my brain, and I'll be like these things. Um, but it looks like a brain. So it looks like, like a brain. What do you mean by it looks like a brain? Like it's pink or gray or like yeah, yeah, and like huh. squishy and gross, you know. Oh, I love that. <laughs> Your commitment to making sure that everyone remembers that like body horror is moist is, uh, is <laughs> I appreciate that. Like there are tactility to this. Um, Charlie Petch asks, was there a process you had to go through to get out of the mindset of the book once it was off to the printers? I think it's really interesting. Like so much of this is about like deep, dark, tortured, you know, artist and like you are hopefully not a tortured artist. So, like how did you divest from that after it was done? I think because it took so long to write, um, I didn't, um, it didn't hurt by the end of it because also um, the parts that I got to add towards the end of the book that made it um, the like really multi-dimensional book that it is and the very human book that it is, they were all the really nice parts of Eva and her wife. Um, so I just got to like write about my wonderful girlfriend and our love and like <laughs> it was just all really like lovely stuff that got to bring it home because like I'd already written all the trauma while I was in these like unfortunate situations. Um, so to finish it, I got to make it lovely. It's nice that you got to do like icing on the cake as the last thing, like you end on a high note. That's fantastic. To yeah. speak of Eva, um, Nicole Labar wants to know, I thought it was interesting how Eva goes blind the more she devotes herself to filmmaking. She's also, you know, uh, figuratively speaking, blind to anything outside of her lens while she's filming. Is there a message there around losing yourself in your art or, or possibly around changing your worldview? Absolutely, 100%. Um, that's almost the entirety of her storyline is um, she comes very close to losing everything because of her singular pursuit of filmmaking. Um, and then for her, it's not worth it. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Do you think, and I mean, like, you may know this or you may not know this because, like, I know that not every author knows, like, every single moment of their characters' lives from cradle to grave. But, like, do you feel that the other two protagonists also 
eventually come to decide like, oh, this is, this is not worth the, the cost. Like I, I, from my, what I remember, Finn has a very interesting, again, like a story begins uh, between Finn and, and her kid um, right in the epilogue. And there's a choice that is kind of laid in front of her. Um, and then with Grace as well, there's a very interesting uh, epilogue, which I, I don't want to spoil that one because that one was really interesting um, to get in a linear fashion. But there there seemed to be some sort of remorse or some regrets and, and maybe a choice on the way for, for her as well. So do you think that they all eventually kind of go, you know what, screw this? Or do you think some of them stick it through to the end? <laughs> I think that um, they do all have like, a, you know, what through this moment. Um, mm -hmm. but it, that's different than the different choices that they have made in their own personal and artistic lives. So Eva's, you know what, fuck this moment, um, gets, is, is beautiful and lovely and warm. And she gets to have like a, a beautiful um, end beginning. The others are a little more fraught. Mm -hmm. Final question. We've, the timing? Perfect. Um, second question from Vanessa Shields. I love, love, love all the things your characters don't say. And I have to second this. The, the negative space is incredible. This is a profound paying attention, I believe, to show this so beautifully. How did you become aware of this or think to use this very real experience in your storytelling? The idea of people crab walking around like what needs to be said and, and shall not be. Um, I'm so glad you love that because I also love it. And that came, that was something that came later um, that I realized I was doing. And it originated in, because um, Eva, <laughs> everyone knows that fiction is like very typically informed by the author's life in some sense, right? This is completely fiction. I made it up. Um, Finn's fraught relationship with her mother is not my fraught relationship with my mother. We're fraught in a different way. I'm kidding. <laughs> my mom is listening to this presentation in the other room. Um, anyway, um, so in Eva's beginning, she's in a, uh, horrific marriage with a man, which we got, um, that horrible man, that horrible man. And, um, there's a scene where they sit down together to go to coffee and he says, um, aloud, you've been a bit of a bitch lately. Yeah. And um, she's surprised and she goes, what? And then I go, but he rolled his eyes and laughed as if you don't know what I'm talking about, he said, but somehow he didn't say it. And she wondered if he was right. And um, I spent in, in that really unpleasant relationship I was in, there was so much like he, he would say something and then I would be like, but you're saying something else and I don't understand what's happening here. Mm -hmm. And so that's when it started. Um, but then I started using it in a much more positive way as well, like the tiny ways that we can communicate things, nice things, loving things to the people that we care about um, as we get more used to them. Um, it's like beam love at each yeah. other. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, I just, it, it was such a huge bad part of my life when I was in um, that like really troublesome relationship. And it is such um, a lovely soft part of my life now um being able to just communicate things without necessarily saying them um that i wanted to have it in the book in both ways mm -hmm. i am beaming love at you now non-verbally but also verbally everybody thank you so much this kind of concludes the the q a portion um i'm so sad to end it i could have i could have danced all night i would love to continue talking about this uh everybody please accost nick on social media to ask further questions because i want to read them um and i would like to formally invite jay and hazel back onto the stream to say anything that they have to say thank you all so much thank you Wow. wow. <laughs> we, um, we feel terrible that we have to come in now and, and begin to wind everything down because this has been just such an incredible hour and we've just been sitting here glued just to every word um, of, this, of this conversation. And it's just been so engaging and so captivating. So thank you both for, for all of that. Um, but alas, the time is upon us and we do have to wind down. So we, we have a few closing remarks, but before we um, say that, Nick, we just wanted to, to certainly 
you know, hand it back over to you if there's any final parting words that you want to, to share before we say goodbye. I just want to say thank you so much again to Sienna. Like this conversation, I've loved this. I can talk about this forever. Um, also, <laughs> neurodivergent brains. <laughs> we'll hyperfixate for nine hours. Yes. <laughs> And um, also, I, I've been doing this on my phone, so I can't like really see the chat, but I, every now and then I'll, I'll see, I can just see that y'all are sending so much love my way, and um, I'm going to get a transcript of the chat after this, and I can't wait to read it. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, it means so much to me, and uh, I love you all. Thank you. Um, Sienna, is there anything that you would like to say before? Run, don't walk. By Suture by Nick Brewer. I screamed when it showed up at my doorstep. Uh, I will tell you that though I haven't used it yet, I am very excited to use this temporary tattoo. This is a boss marketing tool as far as I'm concerned. I have not seen one of these in like 20 years. Um, and this is super cool. Um, and especially if you are an artist and you have been in deep existential pain, like I have been, especially since the beginning of the pandemic, where all of us have so much trouble writing, let alone reading, please sit down with us because it will, it will cathart your way at least partially out of that, I think. It did for me. So thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't know how we can top that. Our <laughs> I know. Rather, I know. <laughs> housekeeping. We're now going to do a, a useless goodbye. <laughs> but before we go, uh, Nick, we do really want to thank you for trusting us mm -hmm. with this stunning and fierce work. Mm -hmm. It really is our honor to be the publisher of Suture and an even greater honor to be your friend. So we, we really can't wait for readers everywhere to find this incredible book and really engage with it. Um, thank you as well to Sienna for leading such an engaging and thoughtful interview mm -hmm. and for squeezing this in between the 900 other things you're doing today. <laughs> that's one more uh, thing. Please go to the word on the street. 8 p.m. We're talking about right. basic income. We all want basic <laughs> income. Nobody here doesn't want basic income. Come and talk about it with us. 8 p.m. EST, word on the street, Toronto, YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> Good plug. Indeed. And of course, we'd also like to thank the people that worked on this book, like Malcolm Sutton, the editor, who's and audience. who's in the audience, and uh, um, Ingrid Paulson, who did the wonderful design of the book. Uh, we also need to send out our thanks to our funders, the Canada Council, the Ontario Car Council of the Arts, um, uh, Heritage Canada, like all, everyone that, that allows us to do what we want to do and need to do. Mm -hmm. um, and we'd also like to send a shout out to Alex Spears, who's hiding in the background. He's our <laughs> tech support for our events, and he does such a great job to make everything seamless so that Hazel and I don't fumble through it like old people. <laughs> the older people we are. That's right. <laughs> and, um, and then finally, uh, on behalf of all of us, I, I just want to send out a big uh, Thank you, of course, to everyone out in Zoomland who's uh, joined us here tonight to celebrate Nick and all things Suture. Um, as Jay mentioned earlier, of course, we had truly hoped that by fall we could all gather in person, but alas, that is not to be, not yet. Um, so we're so thankful to each of you for, for sharing your time and your energy uh, with all of us tonight. And um, with that, I think we just that, want to remind just a you. final reminder yeah. that you can order Suture from our website yeah. or from your independent bookseller. Uh, and uh, I hope you all engage with this book and enjoy reading it. And really, um, it really is such a fabulous book. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it uses the body in such a way to investigate the, the mind, really. Mm -hmm. So it's, I think that's just such a fascinating thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that brings us to the end mm -hmm. uh, sadly thanks to everyone for attending oh wait sorry i just noticed that vanessa in the chat was like oh. can i get to see you and the answer is yes um my contact information is all over the internet i'm very easy to stalk just shoot me an email and i will send you um a little tattoo can we get cookies though is the real question uh, no. yeah. I, I had to order two dozen so yes um if anyone wants a cookie in the mail i can't guarantee that yes it's, like show up <laughs> in one piece but yeah i'll send you a cookie absolutely terrific nice. now i've got cookies on the brain so yes <laughs> so yeah. thanks again to everyone for attending and we wish you all a, a wonderful rest of your evenings please be well and yeah. stay safe indeed
Thank you, everyone. Take care. Good night.